Our Lord, it's with wonderful gratitude and love to you that we've celebrated the cup and the bread. We proclaim your death until you come again. And now as we look into your word, we're asking that you give us some good encouragement in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn to Philippians 1. Kids can make their way to Children's Church right now if you would like to do that. And the rest of us in Philippians uh, chapter 1. I have trouble knowing what to pray. I hear these great, great church people in the history of who can pray for hours on end. What are you praying? Like to sneak in and find out what are they praying for? Take for some, just your kids alone, for instance, or your siblings, and your. How do you pray for them for a half hour? And I'm like, I run out. I, I don't know what to pray, and so I'll even, I'll even end up saying things. And I know you're not supposed to say your, admit that you're saying th- things that are stupid in your prayer. But I'm praying like. God, take care of them. That's good. That's good. Keep them safe. Well, that's a lot like taking care of them. I pray that you would protect them. Now, I think I'm getting uh, a little repetitive at this point. What do you pray? What's the content? We're going to see some great uh, example in Philippians, but I do want to say, it was Soren Kierkegaard who said that your words in prayer, they neither please nor displease God because He looks at your heart. So immediately know that when you're in a matter of prayer and you're saying things that maybe even aren't theologically correct, He's not worried about it. He's looking at your heart. It's all okay. It's like the little kid that comes up to you and says, we'll say a little kid to his dad, who says, oh, we've all had it. I hate you. We're not like overly offended by that. In fact, depending on how they say it, it's kind of cute. So as we're saying things to God in prayer and we're devoutly praying and we say things and we're repetitive or we're praying things and maybe not even accurate, he loves the heart and he loves that you're talking to him. That's really important to note. And in a maturity, as we grow in our faith, our prayers will take on different content along the way. And we're going to talk about a prayer today that is fitting for a sibling, a child, spouse, even an antagonist, your antagonist. I'm going to make you think about your antagonist today. The one who's opposing you at work. The one who is really your adversary. That person. How do you pray for them? What do you say to God about them? We're going to look at a prayer this morning that is fitting in all cases. And it's in Philippians chapter 1. If you've turned there, it's Philippians 1. We're going to be spending 10 or so weeks going through Philippians. And um, let's see. Uh, I, know I, ha- I know this book particular one has Philippians in it. Shouldn't have got it in alphabetical order. That's an odd way to… We did have a guy, we were just talking about him the other day, this guy in our singles group in Phoenix, he showed up with this beautiful new leather Bible, and, and I'm like, hey, nice Bible. He goes, oh, I got it for five bucks, like brand new. I said, really? He goes, yeah, there's a few issues. And I'm like, okay, that's not good. The Psalms were backwards. The entire book was right. He goes, but if you look at the Psalms, it started with Psalm 150. And it was like a countdown. And this guy is so cool. He's so casual. He's like, you know, so that's all right. I just read it the other way. And I'm like, okay, that's a little odd. But this one does have Philippians. Take a look at the beginning. Standard introduction by Paul. He says, Paul, Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, two offices of the church, overseer, which is elder, and deacon. 
Grace to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Standard intro, always remember there's three pieces. It's um, who's writing, it's recipient, and a greeting. Those are the three pieces in almost all the New Testament books. Also take note, verse 2, the order is very important. It's not peace and then grace. It's always grace and then peace. Or he'll slip in grace, mercy, and peace. But grace is always first. We spent a lot of time on that this past fall, that the grace, the overwhelming nature of grace is what produces everything in our life. And so here as well, you don't get peace without the grace of God first. But here it is. Here's the section. A very warm greeting by the Apostle Paul that leads to a terrific prayer that you and I can take with us and pray throughout our week. Take a look at verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. Take a look and note all the exclusive marked remarks that he said. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you all, always, in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer in joy because of your partnership in the gospel from this day until now. He's actually giving thanks for everybody. <laughs> this, is, this already separates a lot of us. I'll thank the Lord for most of you. It's like if you teach school. Yes, I like the majority of my students. You can't say that, right? But, you know, there's some that are a little bit more troublesome than others. I was that troublesome child. You may have trouble believing that. But he's thanking for all of them. All my remembrance of you. Oh, wait a minute. All the remembrance? We had that conflict. I challenged you. And yet, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always, in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. Why? That's partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. Feel this mood that's taking place. We're prioritizing what's supposed to be prioritized. When we come into conflict, and this is true everywhere, this is true in family, this is true at work, and it's definitely true in church, we get into conflict, and all of a sudden the light is on the conflict, and we're like, we're very different. It's not going to work. Well, Step away a moment. What we have in common is far greater than any conflict of disagreement that we might have. It's easy to say that now because I'm relatively new here. I actually own a home. That's how new. As of what? This week. Thank you, Kurt. Great job. Top salesman for Park Place right there. Yeah, he wasn't going to be, but my house put it over the edge. Now, my house about put him over the edge, all right. It's er we're early on, so the conflicts aren't there, and there are certainly times in which partnerships need to be broken, and I, I certainly understand that. But could you imagine Paul actually saying, I thank my God with all of my remembrance of you. The revealing of his heart on this is pretty spectacular. So we could almost pull him aside and go, oh, what about that one guy? 
He goes, oh, yeah, wow. Wow, he sure was against me. Yeah, okay, but you just said, I thank my God in all. He goes, oh, yeah, he loves the Lord. He's, he's fine. What we have in common is far greater than what we have in difference. Always, in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Well, now I'm adding that to my prayer. I'm like, okay, now I've got to be careful in my prayers. There's an Old Testament prayer. There's a name, it's called a pre- imprecatory prayer. I-M-P-R-E-C, imprecatory prayer. An imprecatory prayer is an Old Testament prayer that are those ones that say, oh God, break the teeth of my enemy, Um, ravage them with wild dogs, that kind of idea. It's an imprecatory prayer. You're praying evil or bad against your enemy. That's Old Testament. They're there. There's a lot of them. New Testament, they're not here. We don't have them in the New Testament. It's a completely different mindset New Testament. We don't pray that way against our adversaries in the New Testament. We pray the same grace and love and forgiveness. You take Matthew 18, which is the famous confrontation text. Well, look at the spirit and the heart behind Matthew 18 is all about restoration and love. It's go, if you see someone in sin, go to them privately and kind of, you're like covering and saying, hey, I've seen this. I want to help you through this. It's not looking down at them and judging, but rather lifting them up because you want to see restoration. That's New Testament. So when we go to prayer and you have somebody who's absolutely against you at work, I mean, you know they're after you. They're actually doing a pretty good job at it. I mean, they're, they're getting to you. They've got the ear of the right people. What do we pray for them? What, how do we respond to that? God, I pray that your truth and that you would stop them. In the tr- I know the prayers because I pray them too. And it goes into this retaliatory prayer and a defensiveness of prayer as if this was a scenario that really could bury them. We're in a panic mode. And with Paul, we're not seeing that. We're seeing in Paul there is a love and there is a grace. There is no, there's no urgency. Why would there be an urgency? How much trouble... Does it take to get God tense about a situation? He's not tense. He's not nervous about it. Your family's breaking up, and you can't believe it. You thought they were so good together, and they've got this life, and it's all falling apart right in front of you, and you're seeing it. And all the tension that we have, God doesn't have that tension. So we want to go and spend our time, retreat from the chaos and tension, and rest in the stillness and the calm of his heart, and then I want to pray his thoughts. And that's what we're doing here. We're taking the Scriptures and we're actually praying his thoughts. Verses 7 and 8, he goes on, it's right for me, it is right for me to feel this way about you all. Because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now pull away from the office just a little bit or your school We are talking very directly about fellow believers. That's what this text is dealing with. It's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. You are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For it's my witness how I yearn that you all, with the affection of Christ, you were talking about believers. 
and as believers. Yeah, I don't know how many times I'll be in a conflict and I want to get riled and I do or I get defensive and then once the dust settles, I'm like, they could be right on this. Why do I always assume I'm the one who's right? And I need the reminder to say they're in grace. I want to live in grace. I want to affectionately pray for them and give thanks for them way more than I want to criticize them. As if they're going to win and I'm going to lose. Celebrate the common reception of grace. There was a friend of mine, his name was Rick, and Rick was a great tennis player. Smooth strokes. They were just textbook strokes. He had a clay court at his house, kind of, and it like sloped on the end. And I'm like, I don't, and it's fence, it was, uh, anyway. So Rick, Rick and I actually, we would hit tennis balls now and then together. We only played one time, and I beat him. Would never play him again, right? Is that wise? Why would I, why would I possibly? I would, he'd say, let's, go, let's play a set. I mean, not a chance we're going to play tennis together again, ever, because I beat you, and that's just how we're going to leave it. So Rick was a good guy, and he was... Uh, I was sitting with him. I was reading Bible and praying. He was dying of cancer. It was maybe a month before he passed. And he was, he was giving me all of his opinions on the church, everything we're doing wrong. And it's like he's just laying there in his bed, and he's talking, and he's explaining it all. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. I pulled my phone out and a couple things. I just wrote a few notes of what he's saying. I wasn't necessarily going to look them at them again later, but I had them. And he went on and on and on, and then he finally said, I'll never forget it, he goes, you know what, Pastor? You know what's kind of good about cancer? I went, uh, no, not necessarily. He goes, nobody disagrees with me anymore. You've listened to me for 30 minutes as I've given every opinion on things that you've done wrong, and you've only nodded and thanked me. He says, is that because I'm not going to be around much longer? And we started laughing together, and I'm like, because, Rick, we're sitting here at your deathbed, and what we have in common is way more than what we don't have in common. That's why. Because I love you. And he's laying there, he's like, oh, pastor, I love you. I just wish I could be, I want to see more people come to know Christ. Then the heart's just blending together once again of his love for people and his love for the gospel. That's what we need reminded of. That's there, there it is. The commonality is so much greater than the differences. But we live on the differences. I live on the differences. And when I do, it'll cause division. I want to go back to the commonality again. Here at this church. We ought to care so much more about the mission of the church. We want to make a difference in this community so bad. It has a great history down on Allison Avenue and then here since 2000. It has a beautiful facility for us to be reaching more and more people for Jesus Christ. The conflicts of, of COVID and the conflicts of church has seemingly crippled temporarily, and yet you even look back over the last few years, the wonderful things that are still taking place continually through this church. It's wonderful. That's what keeps us together. That's what keeps us moving is the commonality of that goal. We want to make such a difference in this community that if abundant life were to be moved out of the community that this community would stumble a little bit because they miss us. And isn't it fair to say that many churches in our community, if they disappeared one day, there would not even be a notice in the community? And am I right that we don't want to ever be that church? 
We want to be that church that's making a difference in not-for-profits all over town that we're volunteering and participating and helping with time and effort and energy and finances to the things that make a difference in this community. That's what keeps us together. But what ends up happening? It's, it's the old color carpeting splits a church. It's the music splits a church. I don't like it this way. I don't like it that way. No, maybe I don't either. But it's not the point. The point is that we figure out a way to best reach this community for Christ. And that's what keeps us together. If you look on in this passage, this is the prayer. This is like the point. You're, you're sitting there going, boy, surely he has a point. That's odd. Most preachers have a point. It's verses 9 to 11. Out of the spirit and the mood of thanking God of all my remembrance of you, I just love you. There's grace, there's joy, there's warmth. And then verse 9, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So think of this prayer for just a moment. Think of this prayer and have somebody in mind. Right now, think of a sibling or a child. Not all your kids, one child. Your child or a sibling. And it's your prayer that their love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment or judgment so that they may approve, they can analyze and approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless at the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ to the glory and praise of God. That's what you want for your child and your sibling. Otherwise, what I do is I sit and pray, and I have one of my kids in mind, and I'm praying, God, protect them today and keep them safe. I get that. I I understand that. And I want my kids safe too. I don't want to get a phone call that they're in the hospital and, God forbid, worse. I don't want that either, but I don't know God's will. And I know there's been bad things that have happened to you in your childhood that happened to your children in their childhood. I am well aware of that. But to pray that my kid has, is protected from all harm throughout the day, I understand the heart of it. But I also know that when you're finished praying that, that we get to the point where we then say, but not my will, but your will be done, right? Right? How about if we pray something that we don't have to pray, but not my will, but your will be done, because we're praying God's will. So your kid's on a sports team, and they're doing okay with it, or they're doing great. They're going to get cut. I don't know how the sports team thing is going, but one thing I do know positively, that we want your child their love to abound more and more with knowledge and all judgment. That we want. Oh, Think of it this way. How about this? God, do whatever you need to do to my child so that their love would abound more and more and they would increase in knowledge and discernment. Well, we're now, we're literally at the very core of your values. 
You're willing to sacrifice them getting cut from the team. You're willing to sacrifice their having a health issue or you being removed from the picture because you just said, I want their love to abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. God, I want that. That's value. Oh, I pray they get straight A's, and I pray that they just kill that test tomorrow. Yeah, I get it. I want them to kill the test too. But if you're in my family, oh, they'll kill the test all right. Not my kids. I literally said to my wife, our kids are all honor society stuff. I actually said this out loud. And I meant, I, I wasn't, I said, you know what? I don't think my high school had an honor society. And Sarah goes, yeah, they did. I went, but what? Oh, oh I get it. Oh, I, was, I served on a school board uh, two terms, and they wanted me to speak at the Honor Society induction. <laughs> I thought that was the funniest thing in the world. I texted my brother, and I said, I have some irony for you. I'm the keynote speaker at an honor society. He said, they have one? And I'm like, yes, thank you. Exactly. Graduated 273rd in my class of 500. You can't get more average than that. You know what? You know what? Some kids are just, just smarter than a rock. You know, it's just the way it is. It's the way it be. Yeah, I want them to do well on the test, but I don't want them to do as well on the test as I want their love to abound more and more and them to increase in knowledge and discernment. Am I right? You say, oh, I don't want to pick. You don't have to pick. Pray that they kill the test. But you realize, we do realize, that there are wonderful kids who have killed every test all along the way, and they went and conquered college, and now they're living this life just for the world, and they're all about money, they don't care about the gospel, they don't care about God, right? Oh, I thought, I thought it was all the answer was the good grades. No, good grades are a good idea. I've heard about them. I mean, I've read about that kind of thing in those people. It's a good idea. But what's going to make your kids set apart? It, it literally reveals what your passion and value is for your family. I want them to live a life of love. The Ephesians 5, be imitators of God and live a life of love. Here it is again, that their love may abound more and more. If it's in a hospital bed, it might be. It might be in a hospital bed. Wait a minute, I prayed that that would never happen. Yeah, I know, and you ended that prayer with, but not my will, but your will be done. And it's now a hospital bed. Well, in that hospital bed, we pray that they may abound more and more in love with knowledge and discernment. How about this? So that they may approve, which is to analyze or discern, that they may discern what is excellent. How about that for kids? I want them to know what is most important. And they break up with their boyfriend or girlfriend and and their life is ruined. Well, it's because at that age they think that is so important. And at that age it seems, like, but we want them to discern what is actually excellent. That's how we want them raised. So to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Pure and blameless. So our prayer. God, that you would instill in them their conviction of being pure and blameless before you, that they're willing to part from the crowd if they have to. Lord, whatever it takes to produce this moral compass in them, filled with the fruit of righteousness, 
that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. There's a prayer. So you know this, this story, but when, when Grant, he loved soccer, good at baseball. So we, you know, he's a little guy, six and seven, and when he goes up to bat, we just yell, the other side of the plate. And he's like, okay. And so hitting on either side, just because it was fun and not a big deal. But seven and eight is when we find out he has the eye disease, and very quickly we see the decline. Kind of knew something was wrong. We've been playing baseball in the backyard, right, like a dad's supposed to. And so we'll throw back and forth, and he'd have his mitt on me get hit in the chest with the ball. And I'm like, bud, come on, come on, take off the skirt, play like a man. Come on, let's go, let's go. And he's like, okay, I'm trying, Dad. And I have a throw on the ball, and he keeps getting hit by the ball. And we're laughing. I'm like, well, all right, come on. And we laugh about it, and we go inside. So when he's diagnosed with his degenerative eye disease, so there he is at 8, 9, looking back in his life. And one day he goes, hey, Dad. I said, yeah, buddy, did you tell me to take off my skirt and play like a man? I couldn't see the ball, Dad. And I'm like, no, I don't remember. I think that was Mom. That was Mom. I saw, I remember Mom in the backyard. I remember her playing, um, playing baseball with you, and that was a favorite phrase of hers, I think. <laughs> well, you, you, and you may have had it, too. You, had, you have certain thoughts and dreams of what your kid will end up being and doing, and then something happens, right? And they're not there. Or it's all changed now. And you're like, all oh, these prayers. Yeah, all these prayers. So let's take Grant. Let's take your child that it was a turn that you didn't expect. Their love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. That they would approve what is excellent. To be pure and blameless at the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Well, Grant, out of the three kids, he's the oldest of our three, he's actually known, we call him the moral compass. We're like, well, <laughs> but we had so many, well, what were the plans for his life? What were they? And you say, well, my child's gone. Yeah, what was the plan? It's okay. What was the plan? That they would be with the Father. It's okay. It, it's okay. I would do anything to have his sight back. Right? Wouldn't we? We'd do anything to give that. We'd give ours up in a second. I'd give hers up in a second. To, and then I'd maybe mine. But well, we'd have to talk that through a little bit if it was a choice and a, a form to fill out. But we, want him, we would love for him to, to what he experience. How many times, now that we're in southwest Pennsylvania, how many photos I've sent of deer, right, on the, on the hood of the car kind of stuff, and the beautiful sunsets and things, and I'll snap to everybody, but I don't snap to him. And I think of it every time, because you can't see it. I'm like, oh, yeah, he doesn't have a... So I'll send it to his wife, Michelle, and say, tell him about this. And they send back, oh, he thought that was hilarious, or he loved that, that sounds amazing, right? It's, life changes, but there's some things that don't change. This is the beautiful thing. The, those things that don't change are actually the things of value. They don't change. The value of abounding in love more and more, whether you're in a prison cell and some very good friends of mine in or recently out of jail or prison, wonderful God-fearing people, they can do this. They can have their love abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. They can approve what is excellent. They can be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ, and bring glory and praise to God in that jail cell. They are not in a jail cell. They are free to live God's will as free there as they would be in an apartment or studio apartment or a house in which many of us live. 
What do I want for the antagonist? I want my antagonist to have an increase of love, to have it abound more and more. Knowledge and discernment. Think of the president. You can sit and complain and we can criticize him all we want and we can make jokes and we can do all that. Or we could pray that his love would abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. How about this? So that President Biden uh, and Harris approve what is excellent. That's what I want. I want their discernment, right? Don't we? Yeah, but they're... No, 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 stop that. Pure and blameless in the day of Christ. Oh, now we're getting really something. I'll tell you, we want Joe Biden to have a relationship with Christ, which he might have, and to, after he passes, to live forever with our Heavenly Father and our Savior, right? That's what we want more than anything. Now, that's big. That's bigger than world conflict. This is eternity of somebody. That they're filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ and to the glory and praise of God. I learned this with uh, Fetterman since I've been here. I have watched enough clips of the senator from Arizona. I've watched him. And when I read his tweets of his support of Israel, I was shocked. I didn't expect it. All of his supporters <laughs> didn't expect it either. <laughs> right? You guys following enough of that? And I'm not saying, forget about the topic itself. Think for a minute about the, it was out of character for what we expected and thought we knew of him. That's true of all of our antagonists, and that's true of all political figures. They can surprise us. So what do we pray? Not praying the issues and saying, I pray they change this issue, because maybe some of those I might be wrong. I don't know what it is, but one thing I do know is that our world leaders need to abound more and more in love with knowledge and discernment, approve what is excellent, pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. So there it is, and it's in, the, it's in the bullets. It's on that piece of paper. You could cut it out. What you do is you take that and you interact with it. You read it and pause. Have somebody in mind, a coworker, a spouse. They have a difficult day ahead of them. Your spouse does. Your dad does. And your dad's got a tough day. You know he does. Pray that their love would abound more and more. And you pause. Uh, God, I pray that he doesn't get so caught up in the schedule that he forgets to love people. Help him to abound in love. Help him to overflow in love in those hard meetings he's about to face. With good knowledge and discernment, oh God, I pray that mom, as she's sitting through that meeting, that you give her a discernment that's just beyond her years, and she's old. That they can approve what is excellent, pure and blameless. God, how our young kids are living in these high schools, and many of you who teach. It's a tough atmosphere. I am well aware of that. And good for you. You're living for Christ. You're doing the best you can. I'm proud of you for that. But please know that we're on this side praying that you would be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, full of the fruit of righteousness. That's what we're praying in your life. And I'm not ending with, if this be your will. Because, God, I know it's your will that your grandkids or kids, your brother or sister, would be pure and blameless. God, do what it takes that they be pure and blameless, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. 
Maybe that's something we can pray this week for each other. We could pray it for our family. We could pray it for our antagonists in our life as well. But it all starts with the grace of God being received in our own lives. Unless you have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, the grace is not in you to pray this way. You're still praying that they get a good job, they can meet their bills, and that the car starts. And we're praying just like the world is hoping all of those things. Because of our relationship with Christ, our values are different. We're praying for the depth of love and discernment and knowledge and righteousness in the lives of those we love and those who are opposing us. And Heavenly Father, thank you for the brief time we've spent together today and would ask that you would direct our conversations and our prayers to be pleasing to you, praying your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.